previously on Alaska. There is no sugarcoating what the stampeders of the Klondike Gold Rush have suffered through while making their way from Seattle to the headwaters of the Yukon River. Around every turn, adversity welcomed the ill-informed. So they went up here not knowing what obstacles they were going to face, and that cost them dearly. For the tens of thousands that have made it this far, it will be smooth sailing to the gold fields, or so they thought. The men and women following in the footsteps of the miners of long ago have had their work cut out for them as they've come together to open a mining camp outside Nome, Alaska. The development of a road that will physically connect the outer camps has commenced. Well, we're going to get that road done one way or the other. We're going to start running more hours. And it is now time to connect the camps via radio communication. Sixteen miles may not seem like a long distance, but when traversing the trails over the tundra of Alaska's backcountry, sixteen miles could feel like an eternity. That is the distance between Ketchmark and the main camp at Cripple River. In the unlikely event something would go wrong that far off the beaten path, it is imperative that a reliable form of communication be put into place to link the entire property at Cripple River all the way into the town of Nome. Ralph Yeager has returned to camp with the final container. This one possibly being the most important as it contains the communication equipment. Ralph, Jack and Rizzo must discard of an old corroded container to make room for the new one. Meanwhile, back at the main camp, the supply crew have encountered a problem with the most popular piece of prospecting equipment. The camp purchased new motors that pump seawater from the foot valves into the beach boxes. While piecing the first one together, they realized the PVC fitting connecting the foot valve to the motor was the wrong size. When you're building something new, you're always going to run into kinks. I, I don't care how well it's engineered. Yeah, it works fine on paper, but in the real world it don't work. you got to make adjustments to make it work. If not for the golden sands of Nome, Alaska, the city would not exist today. Working these sands is the reason most people participate in the Alaska Gold Expedition. Only days away from the participants' arrival, it's a last-minute scramble to find a solution to the new problem. And the supply crew realizes that the foot valves must be fixed. They're uh, made out of uh, Schedule 40 PVC. Some of the parts we had to, had to build on our own. After putting their heads together, John and Jim devise a plan and begin the process of fixing dozens of beach boxes. Is you ready? Is ready. That's what makes it fun up here. There's always a challenge and there's always a learning process. Sure enough, 
while bringing the final container into its new resting place. The foremost gets stuck and breaks the camp's water line in the process. Not knowing when and if the weather will shift, the team must hurry and finish dropping the container so they can remove its contents and begin the journey to one of Nome's highest peaks in an attempt to break the camp's radio silence. John Rizzo could scratch a person's back with a backhoe. But he'll be the first to tell you that Murphy's Law was referring to operating heavy equipment on Alaska's tundra. While racing against Mother Nature, the teamwork at Cripple River has finally paid off. The last container is resting comfortably on the shore of the Bering Sea. Well, is it that time? That time. Let's do it. Blake Harmon, the expedition's manager for the GPAA, has the repeater loaded on his ATV and has handpicked a team to accompany him on his adventure to the highest peak near the Cripple River. Being so far out, out of town, uh, and having so many remote locations within the property that are really hard to stay in touch with, communication is just a really important thing. Blake knows there are a lot of repairs still going on at camp, a lot of which that could require his immediate attention but he is forced to take advantage of the clear weather conditions and embark on their journey for the top of the mountain. The main way that we keep in touch with the entire property is through our two-way radio system. To make that work, we actually have to take a repeater up to the top of the highest peak in the area, um, which is quite a trek. Blake is confident that he is in good hands. Ralph and Jack have been spending their summers on this property since its inception and know the land like the back of their hands. While the team continues their odyssey to the mountain's peak, the outer camps are anxiously awaiting the sound of a familiar voice. While communication between the camps along the Cripple River plays a crucial role in the expedition's successful operation, the stampeders of the Klondike Gold Rush were not so fortunate. The people who came to Skagway were itching for news of the Klondike. Many publication companies of the late 1800s sent journalists up north to report on the Klondike Gold Rush. Upon arriving in Skagway and seeing the reality of it all, the majority of those reporters didn't make it any further than a small encampment only three miles outside of town. A lot of journalism going on back then wasn't really accurate and not necessarily as accountable as journalism is today. There's a great story about this little town that got its name called Liarsville. It's where all the journalists hung out, right? Liarsville is a fitting name for the town, seeing as most of the news reports were in fact lies. 
It was either the reporters uh, making up stuff or the stampeders coming down and telling lies about us. They just called it Liarsville because nobody could believe anything that was written about conditions up on the trail. A lot of them made it out to be a lot easier than it actually was, and they made it seem like it was just, you know, this really quick journey. You go up the hill, and, you know, it's a wagon road, and you can just go for a ride, and it's really easy. Boy, all you had to do was take a nice, luxurious cruise up the Alaska Inside Passage, enjoying 12 buffets a day and nightly entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Arrive in Skagway, then take the smooth wagon road known as the White Pass Trail to the summit. But this wagon road only went four miles up, right? And then just kind of petered out. What a lie. <laughs> Who's to say if more or less people would have embarked on the journey to the Klondike had reliable news stories been sent down to the lower 48 and the rest of the world? But one thing is certain. Those that did attempt the trip would have been far better prepared. The world was pretty much in an economic depression at the time. So, you know, the myth that you'd walk down the street in the Klondike and pick up gold nuggets is, would be a big lure to someone who's trying to scratch out a living. When we come back, we'll see what actually greeted the Stampeders as they floated down the Yukon River. Sharp, jagged rocks line the path to the future site of the repeater, so the three must be very cautious on their trek. Getting injured this far off the trail while journeying to set up the camp's communications would seem rather counterproductive. When I go to take the repeater up the mountain, I usually try to get somebody that I can count on to be a, a trustworthy companion uh, that knows a little bit about electronics um, and is willing to go with me no matter what the weather's like or what challenges we have up there because uh, it's definitely not something you want to do by yourself. And, and this year, Ralph Yeager and Jack Swit came up with me and uh, they're both pretty much willing to do just about anything I ask them to. So, so they're pretty good suckers as far as that goes. The team has successfully scaled the mountainside and have reached the summit. The view from the mountain's peak is spectacular. They can see for miles in every direction. Now it's time to construct the lifeline between the camps. Uh, right now we're getting the batteries set up so we can uh, wire them in line so we have a little bit more uh, buffer if the wind generator's not going, these batteries will keep the repeater going. Hopefully we won't have any problems with the batteries totally draining. There's plenty of wind up here. And the wind generator should keep things charged up pretty good. This mountain so far is the only place that we've found that we can set up the repeater uh, where we can reach all of our outer camps, town, all the way down the beach and uh, at camp. talk to town, let's just talk to all the outer camps and keep everybody in the loop with what's going on. So when I'm here, it's like completing a circuit. When you're, yeah. If there's any bad weather, we can just know if there's any flooding or any, any damage or anything like that. So well, we did it right so far. <laughs> Jack's pretty much uh, a jack of all trades. If you ask him to run a dozer, he'll run a dozer. If we need to figure out electronical stuff, uh, he's happy to tear apart a generator and, and put it back together. He's, he's the kind of guy that can pretty much reverse engineer just about anything and get it working again if we need him to. Ralph's also a really hard worker. He comes up, he drives the foremost. He really does kind of bust his butt up here. Without that repeater being up, we're kind of stuck in a rough position. Had the Stampeders found themselves on a mountain peak with great visibility, they might have known what was awaiting them on the river. It wasn't more than 50 miles from the launching off point at Bennett that the waters began moving swiftly. You had men, of course, that were just itching to get to the Kalanite. See, they would put, put together whatever raft they had, and of course, these were not expected. There was no quality proofing. The Stampeders' smooth sailing quickly turned disastrous as the roaring rapids blindsided them. They would jump on these rickety things of doom and it's 
head to the rapids and smashing on the rocks. I mean, men were lost. Within days of the ice thaw, more than 100 boats were ripped to pieces, while the unrelenting white water consumed the lives of several passengers. A lot of people were dying in the White Horse Rapids. There had been a couple hundred deaths and people losing their loads and things like that. For the ones that survived, their gear was long gone. Because it was so quick and so rough, they ended up upsetting and losing all their gear. And so here they were in the middle of nowhere. Even though it is summertime, it's not that long and they had no supplies. Sam Steele of the Northwest Mounted Police heard of the dangerous rapids and immediately took action. Sam Steele was an authoritarian type individual and uh, would take no nonsense. There was huge fear of loss of life. He uh, numbered the boats to ensure that they got through the river system safely and they knew who was coming in and how many. Sam Steele made it a law that every person passing through the White Horse Rapids had to have an experienced guide. The rafts and the boats and the canoes and the steamers were piloted through the rapids. It got so bad that women and children were not allowed on the boats. Uh, they were offloaded at Canyon City and they had to walk a couple of miles and uh, no one was lost. Canyon City was a settlement that kind of grew up as, as Stampeders boats would come in just above the rapids. Folks like, hey man, you better watch out, rapids down below. Among the experienced pilots guiding boats through the White Horse Rapids was well-known author, Mr. Jack London. When Jack London came, it was at the very beginning of the rush. Just like the tens of thousands of people that came here, he was poor, he was hungry, he was unable to find work. So he tried writing before he came up here, but as he came to the Klondike, in his mind, it was to become a rich gold miner. This served as an inspiration for many of his famous stories centered around the Klondike Gold Rush. They had endless challenges. One enterprising fellow actually made himself a little tramway to bring the boats around and you paid for the privilege. And the man was quite clever. He took trees and cut them down, took all the branches off of it, and he had wheels that were the same shape as the tree itself. And he just uh, made a cart and used horses to tow it into town. The simple yet effective design of the tram system was responsible for saving many lives. The White Horse and Miles Canyon Rapids were nothing to be trifled with, and the tram system allowed people the opportunity to bypass this dangerous speed bump on their quest. He would charge three cents a pound or $15 for an entire boatload to bring your stuff around. It was all about very wisely spending what you had. Your bankroll was very precious. So groups of men working together, uh, of course, would debate, should we take the risk? So you had man versus man, man versus nature. It was just a very, very, very difficult environment. Today, a small piece of the tram is all that remains in Canyon City, ensuring people never forget the lives that were lost chasing a dream. Beautiful day, huh? Lake Ralph and Jack have spent hours at the top of the mountain working on the repeater and feel like they're getting close to establishing a solid line of communication between all of the camps on the Cripple River property. Uh-oh. Hey, Jack. This is double tubed. Get out over there. This is not lined up on this side either. You're almost through now. There you go. You gonna leave that in there all winter? Yeah. Well, we got the old south wind blowing. The final touches have been made, and it's now time to test out the repeater. Cripple River, can I get a radio check? This is Cripple River, come on back. Got you loud and clear. How about Trommel? Hey, yeah, yeah. 
Got you clear too, thanks a lot. How about Bob over at Riosis? 10 4, loud and clear. The outer camps have sat isolated from the outside world for weeks. Blake's familiar voice is welcomed by the caretakers at these camps as they see it as a sign that the expedition is about to begin. We were able to install the wind generator, get the repeater set up, and uh, the whole system operating same day, which doesn't always happen, so it's a good deal. Still to come on Alaskan. After countless hours of preparations, the Cripple River Mining Camp has been transformed from a winter ghost town to a prospector's paradise. The property will soon be graced by the presence of hundreds of eager prospectors following in the footsteps of the Stampeders of long ago, whose journey to the Klondike is almost complete. Log on to alaskantheseries.com for extended scenes and sneak previews of future episodes. And don't forget to join the Facebook fan community for all the latest news and updates.